Hello, everybody. My name is Erin Griffith, and I am the educator at the Silver City Museum. I, today, we are not at the museum. We are at Will's Rota House. Will meaning the Western Institute for Lifelong Learning. And I want to thank you all for joining us here today. Um, we are at Will's house. Um, we are at the Will Rota House, where they have this amazing classroom, as well as some other features. Because Will is, our, is helping us co-host this panel discussion on the Chiricahua Apache and the Sacred Return. And with the museum on this program uh, in support of our shared mission of doing programs for the public that bring us information and enlightenment and uh, help to raise some questions and ideas as to how to uh, get involved with the community as well. Back to you, Erin. And so this is a panel discussion. We have three wonderful speakers that will be coming up, and I'm sure you're all very anxious to hear from them. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank Jo Lutz. She is our communications coordinator and AV tech camera woman extraordinaire who has done a wonderful job in getting a lot, so much of this set up and tested, and thank you very much to her. I want to remind everybody that if you have any questions for the hosts, me or Alan, please type those in the chat box. But if you have any questions for the panelists coming up, I want you to make sure to either hold on to them or to type them in the QA box. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. It looks like two conversation boxes. So uh, put your questions in there and we will get to them at the end of the discussion. Uh, so stick around. There will be a Q&A. You want to be there. And um, I just also want to remind everybody that the Silver City Museum depends uh, greatly on your donations. All of our programs are free and we are very much in need of anything that you can give. We recommend a $5 donation, but whatever you can do, that's great by us. And we really are just so happy that you're here. But if you can, donate, donate, donate. And I'll just add on to the donate, donate, donate. These are uh, organizations that definitely make Silver City a special place and a better place to be. So we encourage everybody to join, join, join too. You can join Will. Uh, there's information on the website, which we'll put the link in the chat later on. And the same thing for the Silver City Museum Society, both again, supported strongly by volunteer members everything we do. So I encourage you to get involved and uh, open up your pocketbooks for both organizations. And here Aaron? are our speakers. Hi, everybody. I'm Doug Dinwiddie. I'm a retired history professor, and uh, it's my privilege to be asked to be part of this group today. Uh, I'll be giving some historical perspective and background on U.S. government policy toward Native peoples. I'm Dale Giese, also a retired history professor, as Doug is. We've known each other a long time. And I will be talking about the development of Fort Bear's preservation story and how I became involved with Joe Signs. Doug, with that, I'm Joe Signs, and I uh, would like to share regarding uh, uh, cultural history, uh, traditional history, uh, regarding the Chiricahua and Warm Springs Apaches. Um, thank you very much for allowing us to do this. Ahanda, um, we have begun as a people to uh, recognize our place in this world. And what we need to do, as we have been uh, instructed by the elders, is that uh, we need to acknowledge the land that we're on. And uh, this, acknowledgement, this acknowledgement is for the Chiricahua and the Warm Springs. Uh, we are in the territory of the Inde, 
which included the Tsihet Nde, which is the Warm Springs people on the northeast side of our territory, the uh, Soka Nde, which is the uh, recognized as the Chiricahua down in the southwest uh, portion of our territory. We have the uh, Vidanku, which were in the northwest section of our territory. And we have the Nde, Nda'ai, which is the, uh, um, the uh, Nedni, recognized as the Nedni, uh, in predominantly in now what is Mexico, which is the southeast section of our territory. And we need to do this to encourage our people to be connected to this land and for the Apaches that are in other parts of the country, uh, that they realize that there is a home that they come from. Uh, thank you for allowing us to do this land acknowledgement. And today, uh, I am going to be <clears throat> giving a little bit of background uh, uh, <clears throat> on the history of U.S. government policy uh, in the area. Uh, uh, due to time constraints, I'll certainly be uh, skipping over some important things, but perhaps uh, in the Q&A session, anybody who wants further information, uh, we'd certainly be glad to delve into it. Uh, if I could uh, ask us now to put up the map of the expanding westward uh, map, uh, I'd like to uh, comment on the acquisition of the region. Uh, the part that's shown in the dark green on this map uh, is the so-called Mexican session that's the territory that the United States uh, got from Mexico as a result of the war that was fought between 1846 and 1848. Uh, it was ended by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was signed in early 1848, but not ratified by the U.S. Senate until 1850. Uh, and uh, you may notice uh, that the boundary that was originally agreed to uh, was not quite the same boundary that we are familiar with today between the U.S. and Mexico, and that's because the Gadsden Purchase was added in 1853 to provide a railroad route for the United States. Uh, now, the significant thing for our discussion today is the fact that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that both the United States and Mexico uh, had agreed to provided that the United States would take responsibility not only for the new territory that they had acquired from Mexico, but of course for the uh, peoples who lived in that territory. And that included, of course, the native peoples, including the Apache. Uh, and uh, it's important, I think, to know just a little bit about what U.S. Uh, attitude and policy toward natives was by the time of the 1850s. Uh, the U.S. had determined from uh, an early time in its history, beginning the late 18th century, that uh, the native peoples were viewed primarily as an obstacle to progress. Uh, and as such, uh, as an obstacle, the government sought different ways to deal with that, to move them uh, out of the way of the path of progress. Of course, inherent in that policy was the belief that a uh, uh, white man's uh, Euro-American civilization was superior. Uh, and they saw it as uh, not only a political and social uh, necessity to uh, uh, move the Indian peoples out of the path, but also it was a religious calling as well. It got, gets tied up in the whole concept of manifest destiny. Uh, 
uh, the idea that uh, it was God's will that the Americans would control the continent, uh, the, the white Americans, from uh, the Atlantic to the Pacific. And so out of that idea, it, uh, gradually grew the so-called reservation system. And the idea was to select areas uh, at which the indigenous peoples could be moved to so that they would be out of the way of the tide of so-called progress. And uh, in so doing, then the government would uh, begin the process uh, on those reserved areas, the so-called reservations, they would uh, transform the cultures of the native peoples, including making farmers out of every culture, whether they had farming as a way of life previously or not. And that included the Apache people. They were to be uh, turned into farmers. Uh, and in addition to being uh, having their lifestyle totally redirected, uh, their native beliefs, native culture, native language, native religion was all to be gradually eradicated with the idea being that at some point in the distant future, uh, those people would be uh, assimilated into the major American culture. So assimilation was kind of the uh, long-term goal uh, of the reservation system. Now, specifically in our region of the Southwest here, the major Apache leader by the 1850s was Mangus Coloradus. Uh, and he was uh, the uh, unchallenged leader of the Chihini and uh, uh, Chohokan bands, but he also had great influence in the other bands of the Apaches as well. Uh, might just quickly mention that one of the things that the Americans did not understand was the band structure uh, of the uh, Apache nation, and they did not take into account the independence that the various bands had from each other, and they believed that when they made an agreement with one band that it should apply to all, and that, that was a total cultural misunderstanding uh, on, the, on the part of the American government, one of many. Uh, and in 1852, Mangus Coloradus actually uh, signed an agreement with the U.S. Army uh, at Acoma Pueblo. Uh, and at the time, Mangus Coloradus thought that he and his people were being guaranteed a reservation in what today we call the Mangus Valley. Uh, they called it Santa Lucia in those days. And he also thought that that agreement covered the Pinos Altos range of mountains and the area along the Rio Grande uh, from the Black Range on into the Rio Grande area that we call the Warm Springs region. Uh, as it turned out, uh, Mingus Coloradus's understanding of the agreement versus what in reality came to pass, of course, were, were two very different things because the government had no intention of actually establishing a, an, a reservation in the Mangus Valley, especially after minerals were discovered uh, in the area uh, beginning in the 1850s. Um, as we kind of move forward, uh, uh, if we could bring up the Indian reservations map now. I'd uh, just like to comment that uh, there were several uh, attempts to, uh, uh, yes, that's the correct map there. Uh, there were several attempts uh, uh, to establish reservations for Apaches uh, in the 1850s, but for various reasons, they didn't pan out. And a lot of that had to do with uh, the uh, economic development of the area, particularly in terms of, of minerals. Uh, as so uh, as we see the pattern repeated over and over in, in the American uh, nation, uh, agreements are violated almost as soon as they're agreed to. And usually those violations were uh, spurred by the white population. Uh, uh, and uh, certainly that was the case here 
in New Mexico. And so the reservations of the 1850s were in no sense permanent. It wasn't until the 1860s and 70s that more reservations were established, including the Mescalero Reservation in Southeast New Mexico, South Central New Mexico, and the San Carlos Reservation in Arizona, uh, which was a terrible idea, but uh, the one that the government decided they were going to force the Apache bands to concentrate at. Uh, of course, uh, there were other reservations as well, and we can get into those uh, as uh, we need to later. Uh, what I do want to say, and if we can just go now to the, the, that map, thank you. Uh, the government by 18, the 1860s had established a series of forts. And in fact, the first fort in this area was established back in 1851 at the Santa Rita del Cobre uh, mine. It was called Fort Webster. Fort Webster number one, actually. And, and uh, uh, over the decade of the 1850s, several forts came and went in this area. And of course, in the early 1860s, we have the eruption of the Civil War. And so uh, the, the US government had to take a pause for a few years to settle that issue. And then after the Civil War, a uh, further extension of forts was established in uh, the Southwest, including Fort Baird, which came into being in 1866. It's indicated on this map by the red dot uh, uh, down near the bottom. And uh, at this point, I think I'll uh, turn the discussion over to Dr. Dale Giese. What I am going to um, tell you about is my involvement with Fort Baird in the very beginning. And uh, my wife and I were running a Chautauqua program at the Silver City Cemetery. Our daughter was there. We left that. We do that every 10 years or so. And at the end of the program, uh, I think it was my daughter said, well, what are you going to do now, Mom? because she had done the Chautauqua program. Let's take on Fort Baird. And we did for the next 20 years. The idea was to preserve these wonderful old buildings that were crying out for recognition and certainly preservation. Because over the years, the federal government had done a fairly good job, but the state had not. And some of the people need to hang their head in shame for what they have done to Fort Baird. But we took up the project. I went to Washington uh, on two occasions before a congressional committee. Uh, we asked for state money, we asked for federal money and what we could do. And eventually a uh, Fort Baird National Historic site was established and that was a step toward preservation now under the auspices of the village of Santa Clara. To bring uh, interest of the community and in fact the nation, we had various programs. We had uh, dances, uh, military dances called a hop. We had uh, army bands, everyone uh, wore a uniform in the band and uh, all the participants wore a uh, period costume, usually the 1870s or 1880s. We had baseball games of the uh, traditional period, uh, going back to Ab Abner Doubleday's time and uniforms, the old rules. At Fort Baird, we had German prisoners of war. I uh, interviewed the man who brought 100 prisoners from Lordsburg prison camp to this prison camp. They were treated well. You know, our soldiers uh, didn't do very well in German prison camps. 
But the Germans did well here. I remember one story of Las Cruces, the man who was a prisoner, brought his wife after many, many years ago. He was in the insurance business and he said, here's where I was kept and that place across the street is where I learned to play tennis. Far different from uh, other times. I would like to uh, say that the preservation of these buildings is extremely important. Uh, we raised $200,000 just to recondition the theater building. And uh, other people have done a great deal. And we established the Fort Baird Historic Preservation Society. Uh, many people are active in that. And Fort Baird belongs to the people of New Mexico, but it also belongs to all of the American uh, people. And that's very important to understand. We all own that. We have a stake in it. Joe? So we have a request for you to speak a little closer to the mic. Maybe if you can even take it off and hold it in your hand, would that help? Um, as Apache people, um, we believe that this world was created for us. Uh, the creator and recognition of the creator, Yusin, who with white painted woman and her children, killer of enemies and child of the water, they prepared this land, they learned this land from the creator. So when Apache people emerged and we have identified a couple of areas where we believe that the stories tell us where Apache people emerged onto the surface to populate this land. We believe that Apache country extended beyond uh, the borders of New Mexico. Uh, we believe that our, our traditional territory extends all the way to the Huachuca Mountains, the Santa Ritas, into Arizona, through the Chiricahuas, the Swiss Helms, all the way into Mexico, most of Chihuahua, and then back in toward Texas, the Rio Grande, and past the Rio Grande. Traditionally, we believe that our country extended all the way to the Sacramentos, past the San Agustin Range. Um, and it extended all the way up to Albuquerque. Um, there are stories that Apaches frequently raided that area. And we believe that that's why there are no more Pueblos south of Isleta, below Albuquerque, because that was our country. And through our history, uh, we believe that Apaches have always been here. We do not have any stories that we came from somewhere. We oppose the Lambridge theory that Apaches came from the north. Uh, what I have learned from my travels up north is that uh, that is very uh, difficult to accept because in reality, in Alaska, the people that own the coastal areas are the Eskimos. And those are the people that are the true circumpolar people. And Apaches, we've always been here. We believe that we were here when the Pueblos passed as we have had many cultures come through our country. But in the last migrations, uh, we were here when those pueblos passed that they give credit now to the cliff dwellings. And the people eventually ended up toward Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, uh, Canyon de Shea, up in that country. Uh, as Apaches, we know the stories of those people that passed through here. We know who they were. We also contend that uh, they were not Mogollon, they were not members, they were not Anasazi. We believe that they were simply the people, the ancestors of the Zunis, the Hopis, the Akamas, and those people that traveled north. Our stories tell us that 
by tribal behavior, we can describe this. Just as the Spanish, when they showed up in Santa Rita and threw that country down into the Floridas, exploring for copper and other minerals. When we approached them, we didn't go out to kill them. We approached them as traders to trade with them. Later on, we attacked them because now we saw what they were doing to the land. Same thing with the Americans. When the Americans showed up in, in what they described 1850 down along the line that they were drawing, same thing, Apaches showed up down there, but not to fight, not to kill. We showed up to trade, basically welcomed them. Through that tribal behavior, we also believe that we were here when those Pueblos showed up from the south. I was told from a very young child that my grandfather told us stories that all migrations have always been from the south, not from the north. So it was confusing when I went to school and they started spreading this language theory because that's not the stories I heard growing up. But I understand that little by little those stories are being discredited. I understand a couple of years ago they punched a hole in the language theory and that the 10,000 year span that the language theory operated now is uh, pushed back to 100,000. So we know that these changes will occur. The Forest Service is slowly acknowledging that situation. I understand that um, four or five years ago, they invited a Zuni woman to come up to the Dragonfly Petroglyphs. That is fine because we tell these stories. And a lot of times we are discredited because we have an oral tradition. You know, now there are many, very many books that have been written about Apache culture and history. Um, our tradition is oral, and it seems that modern society, society is uh, hesitant to accept oral traditions. But that is, a, that is the way that we know how to tell our stories. But through time, uh, the value of this country, and we can describe it just simply by the fact that if you look at our maps and the way that people came in here, uh, we believe that the forts were often put in places that afforded us resources, afforded us water, afforded us food, and that those places were some of the first places they put forts was to scatter us and disperse us out further. We believe that um, it was going to be very difficult for us to hold on to this country even though we fought and fought. Um, the value of this land was just too tremendous. Uh, we can tell that nowadays by the majority of Chiricahua territory, as this map that has been put up shows, uh, the majority of Chiricahua territory and Warren territory has now been relegated to national forests. We have the Gila National Forest in the heart of our country. We have the Apache National Forest in Arizona. We have the Cibola Forest. Uh, east and north of us, and then we have the Coronado that is to the south of us. That is all our traditional country. But the value of it has always been uh, what is the most uh, attractive to it. But I believe that as Apaches, we manage that country. We just thought to not just live on it and move around. We manage that country in a way that it kept it in pristine order. Um, when the Spanish came in, the grasslands, the timbers, uh, the forests, the water, they were all pristine. When the Americans came, all the, the minerals, uh, same thing with the grasses, the timbers, the waters, everything was pristine. That was our land. That's what we protected. But it was viewed as resources. And that's what um, sort of gave us the trouble, that eventually this land was going to be too valuable and we were going to be eventually moved. And as our history through wars that we believe were not just war, but a genocidal war because it was not just the men that were fighting, it was the children, the elders, the women. Uh, we all had to fight to protect ourselves, to try to stay on this land. But eventually, uh, through time, we lost that foothold. And possession of this land uh, even though we fought the Spanish and we fought off the Mexicans, 
And we believe that the Gadsden land purchase one of, was one of the last nails that was uh, hammered into this cultural coffin of ours to move us from this land. Uh, because I understand that at one point, uh, the government of Mexico was ready to just give up that land back to the Apaches since they could not control it. And that the Spanish government had decided to move all the resources and efforts to the south, that's where they were having more trouble. But because of that, that sort of opened up the region. And the Americans, with their resources, were able to convince the Mexican government that they would buy it, that they would purchase it. And that land became the Gadsden land purchase. And that's what we believe uh, enabled the American government to uh, put claim on that land. And though we continue to say that we lost possession of this land, we still hold 100% spiritual ownership of this country. And we intend to bring it back. And that's how we began. After being removed from this land, uh, killed off, scattered, uh, imprisoned, enslaved, we uh, were scattered to the four directions. Uh, we have people that were scattered out to Arizona, scattered into Mexico, scattered further north. We know of the prisoner groups that were sent to Florida uh, and many others that attempted to stay. Uh, we very well know the uh, story of uh, Masi. They often pronounce it as Masai, but we pronounce it Masi. Uh, his efforts to stay in this country. To this fight, and as Doug uh, mentioned, uh, eventually the reservation systems were set up. Uh, Mexico has started reservations uh, quite a while back. They called them presidios. And as long as the Apaches were friendly and traded, they were allowed to come and stay close to the presidios. And that was an effort by the Mexican government to pacify them and allow them to trade and allow them to come in peacefully. But in reality, it's just a way to keep track of them and know where they were and what they were doing. Uh, the atrocities still continue through that time. What we understand now is that because of the value of our land, we were scattered out, but other tribes uh, that managed to negotiate with the government a little bit better were able to stay. As Doug mentioned with Santa Lucia and the Mangus Valley, that was just one of eight reservations that we negotiated for. We have that history. We know where they are located. We know what size they are. But we attempted to settle. We attempted to accommodate the American culture by negotiating for eight reservations in this region. And unfortunately, none of those ever came to bear. Uh, we lost them all. Um, jumping up a little head, um, now that we are scattered all over the place, we have people in Oklahoma, we have people in Icaria, we have people in San Carlos, we have people in Mescalero, we have people in Mexico, and we have what many people call the free Apaches that just never surrendered and, and um, blended into the country as best as they could. Scattered as we were, uh, we never lost this connection to the land that we have that we call that spiritual ownership. And it seemed like a um, collective consciousness that we all felt. And so for me, uh, I grew up in Isleta, east of El Paso. Uh, my family came back from Mexico, and they entered into this country. And the safest place they could find was Isleta. And that afforded them safety, that afforded them close to a, a native group, that afforded them close to people of our own color. And it afforded them that safety to establish themselves. Uh, our whole family came over, including grandfather, uncles, aunts, everybody we decided that we had to come back to this country. Our great-grandmother used to always talk about her northern mountains as she spoke of the Black Range. That is where my father is from. He is from the Tsihantende, which is the Warm Springs people, the Red Paint people of the Black Range. In my travels, after I um, 
uh, left home, um, I found that I lived in Canada, I lived in Alaska, but then eventually uh, I realized that I had to come home and I wanted to come back somewhere close to what our family stories were. Um, and so I decided to come back to the Silver City Grand County area and establish myself here. Due to a, uh, uh, an investigation that I was involved in and subject to, um, and when they came to investigate and they did not find what they were looking for, uh, because I am a powwow dancer and I follow our religion, many of my eagle feathers were on my wall, my bustle, my dance stick, my fan, my headdress. Not a, not a Plains headdress, but a uh, Apache style headdress. Um, they took it. They accused me of uh, being a black market uh, collector and that because I am not a recognized Indian, that I had no right to have these eagle feathers. And so when I took care of the uh, first case, non-related, and it was, I was able to uh, put it behind me and take care of it, I moved on to retrieving my feathers because they were confiscated. Um, this was a long process, and a very uh, involved process dealing with the federal government. Uh, the initial initial contact was a uh, federal game and fish. And through that process, I needed to uh, uh, obtain attorneys and I needed to uh, look into uh, getting support for this situation. Finding an attorney was a big thing, uh, but I was finally able to. Uh, I began my first hearing, uh, which was in Las Cruces. Uh, interestingly enough, I realized that there was some kind of uh, uh, recognition of what was going on because I remember the judge in Las Cruces said, uh, Mr. Sines, uh, uh, don't plead guilty. Plead not guilty and fight this. That came directly from the judge in Las Cruces. And so I did, and he uh, referred the case up to Albuquerque. Uh, at that point, I knew that I needed to um, get more serious regarding our effort to defend myself and to retrieve these confiscated uh, items of my culture. Uh, and that was the time that I um, uh, came across uh, Dr. Gisi. Um, it was very difficult to find people of any knowledge here regarding the Apache uh, because this country seems to um, deny that history, uh, especially around Grant County. It was a very hostile area for us. And I could just, I uh, was not able to uh, find the support here. Uh, it seems that Silver City and Grant County seem to give more attention to the Pueblos that just temporarily passed through. But for the original settlers, the original people here, uh, it, it was more difficult for us. But in meeting Dr. Giese and understanding his knowledge and his background, um, he was the uh, perfect witness for us as he was able to acknowledge the Apache history here, uh, not just by the uh, interest and, and research reports, but just that they were the people that were here. And of course, the major um, point of this uh, relationship was the fact that Dr. Giese was able to relate the fact that Apaches did use eagle feathers because they actually tried to use that in court was that Apaches didn't use eagle feathers. But Dr. Giese established that and with his word, we were able to uh, move forward in our defense. Uh, through that time, uh, just in quick synopsis of this uh, trial, there were four hearings. Las Cruces was the first, Albuquerque with uh, Judge Meacham, Edward Meacham, I believe, uh, awarded me my feathers and my items back right then and there. But because of the government's interest uh, to defend the Eagle Permit, the Eagle Feather Permit System, which is what they were using against me, because the federal government still holds um, influence over native religion by that act, by that uh, uh, federal, evil federal permit system. Uh, 
as long as they do that, Apaches and most uh, and native people around the country are not truly free because they continue to control whatever they can and however they can. Um, and finally, uh, it ended up in Boulder, Colorado, where I was, uh, um, my site was found for, and then also in Denver, Colorado. We were set to go to the Supreme Court, um, but the government gave up and it ended there. But my relationship with Dr. D.C. began, uh, I started visiting him, uh, visiting with him and asking him questions regarding our, our position here and our, our history here. And he recommended uh, being involved or considering Fort Bayard as a possible uh, location for our activities or possibly future activities that we may able to produce. And that's how I became involved with Fort Bayard, uh, was through Dr. Giesti. And through time, we just uh, attempted to work with Fort Bayard, uh, bring our culture into it. And eventually now, uh, we believe that uh, with, with uh, the way that things are now and with the way the state has changed in Santa Clara, uh, we want to make Fort Baird our headquarters. We want to establish that as a base for the Chiricahua Warm Springs uh, people here. Um, traditionally, as I mentioned, there were four bands. Um, I believe that there are now four bands again in this area, including Fort Sill, that is now uh, uh, has an area down there on I-10. We have the Ojo Caliente Restoration Group, which is a group that has come back from California that I believe they were subjected to the uh, Indian Relocation Act. Uh, we have our uh, efforts and organization and tribal unity here that we have is uh, called Chiricahua Apache Nation. And I believe in Las Cruces, there is a uh, village called Tortugas, which uh, the Piro Mansos people live. And the Piro Mansos are actually Apache. Uh, Monsos um, is, a, is a Spanish word that means tamed. And basically, they were just uh, referred to them mostly because they were more apt to come in and trade. Uh, and so um, uh, we now have four Apache groups in the area again. And uh, we hope to work with Fort Baird and establish our headquarters there, also including a um, museum and culture center that will welcome all Native people that come through here. And uh, we are now working on a uh, permanent powwow grounds and ceremonial grounds called the Red Paint Powwow uh, Dance Harbor and Ceremonial Grounds. And we are working for Baird, Santa Clara Village, and uh, hopefully many more that will come into our, our support for this, uh, for this new uh, stage in, in Chiricahua uh, return. Uh, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and uh, show the video. Uh, what we did was uh, took, a, took a drive out to Fort Bear and uh, gave a little uh, um, representation of the building that we hope to use as a headquarters and the grounds for the power. The following video clip recordings are of the proposed site for the Chiricahua Apache Nation headquarters to include an Apache museum and a culture center. This is building in 25, which is a duplex. It has 25A and side 25B. The Chiricahua Apache Nation is slated to move into 25A as 25B is the new proposed Fort Baird Historic Preservation Society Visitor Center. We look forward to beginning this new phase in local Apache efforts.
grounds you see here, which are the old hospital grounds, have been selected as a possible future site for the proposed permanent red paint powwow dance arbor and ceremonial grounds. The site will include a dance arena, an announcer stage, performer setting and location, and public seating. This arena will be open to other events by the community. We look forward to working on this project and gathering much support and funding. Uh, at this time, I, you know, first of all, I would like to thank uh, 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 Doug Dinwiddie and um, uh, Dr. Dale Vesey. Um, thank you for your support and thank you for uh, allowing us the, you know, the, um, the space to, to do what we feel we need to do. And, and we uh, appreciate that you believe in that, in that effort. Um, what's next for us is that uh, for the Chiricahua Apache Nation, we continue to uh, organize the tribe, we continue to um, move efforts forward, uh, projects. Um, um, we will eventually work toward recognition, uh, federal non-dependent recognition is what we believe will work best for us. And our continued effort to uh, remain uh, with uh, Fort Barrett Historic Preservation Society because um, uh, we believe that um, it's a great partnership. Um, they have the Apache history here and uh, we are returning to it. And so I think um, uh, with the, the building 25A and working toward that project, which I know is going to be a uh, uh, a big project for us to be able to work on that building and then move into it. Uh, also the powwow grounds. Uh, that's a major project that um, we are so glad that we have the space and the uh, interest uh, to do that. Um, so we can bring back the powwow and also bring other, other events to the area, uh, including uh, giving space for other community uh, activities and other community organizations that can come in and use the uh, the site also. Um, and so it's a, it's a future that we're looking forward to. Uh, it, it's a future that uh, we can invest in. And um, I believe uh, uh, our economic input uh, can be great in this area. And so uh, I, I appreciate this time. And uh, to all you uh, people that came and joined us, uh, Ikeke. Dale and I have, uh, of course, both been, uh, Dale, uh, more responsible than anyone probably for getting the Fort Baird organization rolling. Uh, and then I came aboard and joined uh, several years ago and uh, uh, was very pleased when Joe uh, agreed a year ago to uh, uh, serve on the board uh, of the Fort Baird Historic Preservation Society. I think it's so important to have uh, his input uh, and his nation's input into uh, our activities as, as we go forward. Uh, I just mention a couple of things uh, that uh, are important to know is that uh, with the help of uh, the village of Santa Clara, uh, and particularly Dave Chandler, one of our members who is a talented grant writer, uh, we received a grant from the Saving America's Treasures uh, uh, program, which is actually a park service program. Uh, uh, and that grant is paying for the installation uh, or 
rehooking up, we should say, uh, of electricity into the museum building uh, and the adjoining building 25, uh, which Joe alluded to. Uh, and that work is ongoing as we speak, and we hope within the next several months uh, uh, that a project will uh, uh, be finished up and it'll be ready then for the development of the uh, museum and, and uh, heritage center uh, in building 25 alongside the museum, uh, which is in building 26. Uh, I want to thank the village uh, for their, uh, uh, the village of Santa Clara for their uh, continuing efforts over the years to finally achieve a lease from the state of New Mexico. Uh, uh, if any of you are familiar with state bureaucracy, you know all the challenges that that uh, presents and those challenges will, I'm sure, continue to some extent into the future. But with everybody working together, we're sure that uh, we will overcome uh, any further obstacles. And we really look forward to getting uh, financial support from uh, granting organizations to fulfill Joe's dream of the powwow grounds uh, on uh, at Fort Baird. And that'll be a big step toward uh, making the presence of uh, the Apache, the Chiricahua Apache people, a permanent one uh, at Fort Baird. I wonder why uh, Joe has anything to do with this really uh, being a military post. And I ask him these questions once in a while. I am very pleased that he is part of the group. This building, I see uh, exciting things happen, uh, as well as the post itself. But as a cultural center for the Apaches, as a study center, uh, we've already gathered thousands of dollars worth of books and documents. And a lot of it is related to uh, the Apaches. So thank you, Joe, very, very much for joining us and being part of this group. And as I said before, it's not just for people in this area. It's not just for the American people. This is an international thing. We have a lot of German visitors and uh, European visitors that come. So in this area, we need to be proud of Fort Baird and support Fort Baird and cleanse Fort Baird for the Apaches, which is going to be a difficult thing, I'm sure, but it needs that. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, that was an amazing talk. Uh, everyone stay around. We have a lot of questions for you, um, some of which are from our very own Alan Reagans. Uh, from Will. And, um, but first, I just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions for our panelists today, please type them in that QA box, and then we will get to them. What will happen is I will bring you on, and you will be available to speak to the panel. So um, let's see. I'm going to start off with a question by Patricia Dinaranjo. I'm sorry, I cannot see your name. So let me pull up Patricia here. Okay, um, let's see, it's not letting me let Patricia talk. So I'll go ahead and ask her questions. Um, Patricia wants to know uh, why the Germans were prisoners. I think she, she may have heard something mentioned about the Germans being held prisoner at Fort Baird and wants to know a little bit more information about that. We fought a war called the Second World War and we captured a lot of Italians. Not many Japanese, a lot of Germans, 
and we brought them over here. Uh, they were at Lordsburg. They were throughout the West as prisoners. And uh, they straightened tombstones up. They had an orchard at Fort Bear. They had a dairy at Fort Bear. Uh, they did a lot of work. And it was a wonderful place to be rather than the Russian front. I mean, it was just, just a great place to be. And uh, they were kept here sometimes in this country to 18, 1946, uh, some into 1947. There was a, quite a group down at uh, Deming. And one of them jumped a freight train, he escaped and he went to California and became a ski instructor. And finally he was married out in California and finally he uh, uh, turned himself in uh, that he was a, I don't think there was any penalty, but uh, just the story about a man who was a prisoner who escaped from Deming uh, at that time. That's a pretty good answer. Um, we have another, an anonymous question that maybe Joe, you can help with this. Um, someone would like to know if uh, there was such a thing as, an, as the Membrano Apaches or are they also known as the Chiricahua Apache? Uh, within the uh, uh, Nde, which is the Apache people here, as I mentioned, there were four, four distinct groups that were recognized by the, by the people at that time. Um, uh, the American pronunciation for them. Uh, oh, oh yeah. The American pronunciations for them. Uh, the first one is the uh, Chihene, which is um, uh, the red paint people. Uh, the Nedi, um, the uh, Chokonen, and uh, the the Donkohe. Uh, those are those are basically the majority of the names that you see written down. Um, and so those were the four recognized bands of the of the of the Apache here in this area. The Mexicans, when they first came in, because um, my understanding is those names that were given uh, members, uh, I understand is just the Spanish word for willow. Uh, because of the uh, willow stands that were noticed along the rivers, the Membres, the, the Gila. Um, and from my understanding that the Spanish, the Mexicans started calling most of the Apaches that they saw camped along the Membres River because uh, that was one of the major rivers. Uh, we had several major rivers in this area, but one of them was the Membres. And predominantly, it was the Warm Springs Apache that were related to the uh, groups around the Black Range that extended all the way from the Rio Grande all the way to the central part of the wilderness, which is the Gila Wilderness now. Um, the, the Gila Wilderness was a common ground for all the four bands uh, in these northern strongholds. The Sierra Madre was the southern stronghold. But the Apaches, the warm strings that camped along the Membres, which was a name given to them by the Spanish, that's where we believe the word Membrano came from, but it is not a recognized Apache name. It was reference to the warm strings. Okay, that's, thank you for that. Um, before I forget, because I did forget earlier, I just want to pop in and give a strong thank you to Kirsten Kairos for that wonderful video that you used earlier. That was a really professionally and beautifully done video and I think it shows a lot of the promise and what needs to be done. So I wanna thank Kirsten for that. Um, and let's see, I'm at this time, Alan Reagan, our, our friend in the other room would, has a question for you guys. I'm gonna let, he's gonna go ahead and ask that. Actually, I'm going to link my question to, to a question that we got from somebody else. Uh, the, their question was, how many members of the Chiricahua Apache tribe, more or less, are there at this point? And I guess my, I was wondering about what are the requirements to be a hard carrying member of the nation? Um, well, from, uh, from reference, um, as far as our groups are concerned, 
Uh, with the Chiricahua Apache Nation, I believe we're uh, probably close to 400 members uh, at this time. And um, we do have a citizenship council that uh, reviews applications. And our interest is to um, retrace the descendants and uh, trace the descendancy lines of these Chiricahua people. And so in our Chiricahua Apache Nation, uh, we have a, um, a variety of members. Uh, we have members that are um, part Apache, and we have members that are full Apache, uh, as we do not uh, um, discriminate against uh, any Apaches that may be members of other tribes. And so we have uh, those Apaches that are Chiricahua that are actually tribal members of either San Carlos, or San Carlos uh, White Mountain, or Fort Sill that are actually uh, tribal members with our, uh, with our group. Um, but uh, the, the uh, Citizenship Council uh, researches the applications, researches the histories that are given. Um, nowadays, uh, people attempt to uh, send in as much information as they can regarding uh, their, their uh, descendancy. Um, they can be from church records, they can be marriage records, they can be death records, they can, you know, even people have gone to the Mormon church, uh, Ancestry.com, DNA, um, anything that, that they can collect uh, to uh, um, identify their family line. Uh, and so at the moment, that's how we are, are looking at the uh, Chiricahua Apache descendants that approach us and uh, want to be a part of our group. So, um, hope that helps. Thanks. Um, let's see. There is a question from Tom Hester. I'm going to bring him on here just a second. Tom, are you there? Please unmute yourself. I'm here, Erin. You are live. Go ahead. And I was interested, uh, Joe, it's a very exciting um, prospect of having a, a powwow, a arena, uh, a, a place of permanent uh, uh, exhibition in the museum. Do you have estimates of how much money you're going to need to raise in order to fulfill your your vision of what, what uh, is going to be at Fort Baird? Um, well, at this moment, no, we don't have an exact uh, number, even though we, through, uh, with our nation, we are continuing to uh, raise money, um, you know, that the nation itself has uh, in its own, um, in its own uh, accounts. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the time that um, we are able to discuss with Fort Baird and Santa Clara just what the next step is into moving into those buildings. I believe at that time, then we can kind of see exactly what will need to be done for us to initially move in. And um, as far as the power grounds, uh, we applied for the 30 something grant last year just to start us off, but it was denied. So we will continue to um, uh, investigate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I have another question from Jeffrey Sykes. Jeffrey, are you with us? Jeffrey, are you still there? If so, unmute yourself. All right, looks like that may not work. I will go ahead and answer that for you. Um, Jeffrey would like to know if Apache customs and language are similar to the Navajo. I missed it. I, I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Oh, sorry. Um, are Apache customs and language similar to Navajo? Um, customs, um, very different. Uh, but uh, language, we are of the Athapaskan group, 
And so language and dialect are very similar. Uh, there are dialect differences, but uh, the language is very similar. Okay. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. And I have another question from Cindy Provincio. Cindy, are you there? Okay. Um, well, Cindy would just like to know if um, what we can do to make this happen. How people can and the community can help uh, realize this. What can, <clears throat> uh, if I understand the question, uh, what can we do to make all of this happen? I would say one of the uh, easiest things to do would be to join our Fort Baird Historic Preservation Society uh, and uh, work with us uh, the, as, uh, and with, of course, Joe uh, and the Apache Nation uh, in helping make all these things happen. Uh, uh, anyone who's interested in uh, joining the uh, Fort Baird Historic Preservation Society can contact me uh, Doug Dinwiddie uh, at 388-4862 uh, or Cecilia Bell at 388-4477. Uh, there's also, we have a website which is uh, fortbaird.org and you can join uh, through the website uh, as well. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we will be, uh, we always are uh, willing to listen to ideas uh, and uh, donations uh, are always welcome. And if you spe would specifically like to donate to uh, the, uh, the powwow grounds or, or the uh, uh, Apache uh, uh, Museum and Visitor Center at uh, the fort, uh, uh, you could certainly let us know uh, in those same ways. Uh, Joe, did you have? Um, yeah, the other, the other um, uh, recommendation also is if um, uh, you are uh, or believe that you are uh, a Chiricahua or one string descendant, we also encourage you to- Joe, can you speak into your mic a little more, please? Uh, that if you are an Apache, uh, Chiricahua one string descendant and you are interested in applying for citizenship with our nation, you're welcome to. We uh, disseminate a lot of information through there. Um, and so uh, that, that is another way that you can keep, uh, uh, keep attention to this, uh, uh, this project. Um, we have a, uh, a website. It's called uh, www.chiricahuapachination.org. And we also have the redpaintpowwow.net. Uh, and so uh, anytime that we can, we put out information for uh, anybody that's interested. So I'm, I'm certain that we'll start disseminating information regarding the powwow grounds through that uh, powwow site um, and also through our nation site. So uh, stay tuned or contact us if you have any information or any um, questions. Um, our office number is 575-534-1379. Uh, Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, and let's see, Kayla Grijalva. Hello, can you hear me? Um, so my question is, Given the scope of the project, is there a proposed timeline for when both the headquarters and the powwow grounds are going to be up and running? I, I will take that first <clears throat> uh, from, uh, let's talk about the buildings first. Uh, it would be nice if uh, we were in control of the timeline, but unfortunately uh, uh, the work that has to be done on the buildings has to be done uh, by contractors through the village of Santa Clara and with input from the state. And the current situation with the COVID 
uh, uh, crisis has restricted uh, inspections by the state that are necessary for installation of utilities and that sort of thing. So uh, in a way, it's, it's very difficult to guess right now how far out we're looking at having the utility part of this all done. Uh, I would say probably not any sooner than the next three to six months from now before that part of it will be accomplished. Uh, Joe, do you want to comment on the powwow grounds and your hopes there? Um, well, um, <clears throat> you know, we had, we had hoped uh, in the beginning when we first applied for that 30 something grant, we had hoped that uh, possibly for the next powwow. This, this year, uh, unfortunately, because of the uh, pandemic, we had to cancel the, the uh, powwow that we had scheduled this year, which was on Fort Bear grounds, but not within the uh, uh, stated lease area by Santa Clara. And so we had worked directly with the state to establish that permission and permit for that event, and we did get it. We had everything set up, but um, our uh, uh, timeline, because now we're going to go outside and we're going to do it during good, hopefully, good weather. So it's a, a multi day event where people can camp out and be there. Um, so I'm hoping that. We will try uh, for next year to have the powwow grounds in place, if not in the final form, at least in the beginning form. Uh, but if not, we'll just continue to work on it. Uh, you know, we've been working on this, uh, I believe, since 2003, 2000, yeah, since probably 2000 itself, uh, when we uh, started, you know, uh, dialogue as far as our ideas and, and how to come together and, and the introduction into Fort Payer uh, for us. So uh, back in, I think it was uh, 2000 or 2002, somewhere there, we had a big gathering at Fort Payer. Uh, a lot of Apaches came from all over the country. And uh, we initially did the, uh, uh, expressed our interest uh, to be there. So uh, it, it's a long-term project, but we're hoping that we're getting closer and closer every year. Um, and as soon as uh, we get the go-ahead, we're going to jump right on it. So please stay tuned. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Okay. I'm going to bring on Claudia Alfredic. Hello. Hello, Claudia. Hey. You're here. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I'm very excited to see the groundwork being laid to have uh, this Navajo presence, Navajo, this Apache presence here in Grant County and specifically at Fort Baird. I have a question about the Buffalo Soldiers. Was there any historic conflict or connection between uh, the, those particular soldiers and the Apache people? And is there any connection now between those two groups? Uh, I'll comment first and then uh, the others can join in. Uh, yes, certainly the, uh, during the active military period from 1866 forward, uh, Fort Baird was closed down as an active post in 1899. The Apache Wars are usually said to have ended with the surrender of Geronimo in 1886. So if you just look at that 20-year period from 1866 to 1886, uh, the two Buffalo Soldier Regiments in the U.S. Uh, Army, uh, that is cavalry regiments, who did most of the operations in the Southwest, were the 9th and 10th Cavalry. And the 9th Cavalry especially was very prominent at Fort Baird in the 1870s. Uh, and uh, very prominent, in, particularly in the Victoria War. And so they had occasion to be involved in uh, combat with uh, uh, Apaches uh, on many occasions during that era. As far as current contact between the groups, uh, perhaps Joe can, can address that. I, I don't know a lot about that. I do know that there are 
Buffalo Soldier historical groups uh, that have expressed interest in having a presence at Fort Baird as well. Uh, there's nothing formalized at all about that at this point, but we do know that there is an interest. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I, I think it was probably almost 10 years ago, <clears throat> we had, um, because of our interest and our involvement in Fort Baird, uh, we had uh, met uh, one of the commanders of one of the Buffalo uh, historical groups out of Arizona. And we went, met with him and uh, we were interested in possibly doing a reconciliation with the Buffalo soldiers. And so we had uh, hoped to develop a relationship with them. Um, but I believe at that particular time, the commander was not in very good health and, and he was not able to follow through on some of the efforts to um, come together and, and um, uh, you know, discuss that history and uh, come to some uh, agreement as far as how to move forward. Um, we believe that at that time, if they were going to be involved in Fort Bayard, that it was probably important that we do that. Um, we're still hoping that at some point we can uh, resume that dialogue, uh, but at the moment we don't have any uh, pending or any continuing work with any of the Buffalo Soldier uh, groups. Um, but I know that they are a part of a big part of that history. So, thank you. We have been in contact with General Colin Powell. That was five, ten years maybe 15 years ago, time goes by very quickly. And uh, he expressed an interest in what we are doing with the Buffalo Soldiers at Fort Baird. Okay, thank you. Claudia, does that answer your question? It does. It's very interesting to hear that there has been some contact and I hope it can continue. I think reconciliation is really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I have another question from Patricia who just wants to know if you can repeat the email address. I think that's for you, Joe. Uh, for the Chiricahua Apache Nation, it's www.chiricahuaapachenation.org. And for the powwow, it's uh, www.redpaintpowwow.net. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Alan, do you have another question? Uh, sure. Okay, um, let's see. Who is next? Um, Vicki Barnett, let's bring her on here. Vicki, oh, looks like Vicki is not currently on. Tim Trofe. So, Patricia Gerald, Gerald Schultz, I'm going to bring him on. Gerald, are you there? Gerald? Um, well, it looks like he may not be joining us. Gerald asked, um, he said that Joe is part of Building 25 to be used by the FBHPS, Fort Barrett Historical Preservation Society. Uh, is this an expansion of their presence in Building 26 or to move the presence from the armory? <clears throat> yeah, 
at this time, uh, it's uh, uh, considered to just be uh, an addition uh, to what we already are doing at the armory, uh, the visitor center, which of course the visitor center has been closed uh, due to the COVID restrictions. Uh, but uh, uh, the building 25 uh, presence for both the historical society and the Apache Nation uh, is in addition to what uh, is already in place. So to answer the question, as I understand it, there's no plan to close up uh, operation at any of the other sites. Okay, thank you very much. And we have James Hickerson. James, are you there? Please unmute yourself. All right, never mind. Let's see, who else Anne, wants? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, James. Hi. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, uh, this is for Joe. Um, is there an intention to uh, seek new reservation lands and a new tribal recognition uh, in your eventual plans? Um, you know, at the moment, um, without federal recognition, uh, it, it could be difficult to um, apply for that. But what we have been finding is that uh, uh, people have been donating land to us. Um, and it's a uh, land that w is within our traditional territory. Um, so at the moment, we do have uh, 13 acres uh, just south of Belen. That's traditional territory. Uh, we're in the process of acquiring five acres in the Chiricahua Mountains. Um, that's within our territory. Uh, and so we are hoping to um, be able to acquire some land to be able to uh, uh, establish more Chiricahua ownership. Uh, but at the moment, our, our, main, our main focus is to establish ourselves at, at Fort Bayard. Uh, you know, when, when Apache started coming back here, the, there were questions by people. Um, I remember questions like, are you gonna run us off our land? Uh, are you guys going to put up a casino? There was all these kind of questions that came up to us regarding our presence here. Uh, some of those questions weren't just out of curiosity. Some questions were out of fear uh, because that history kind of lingers a little bit about that, that uh, fear about Apache. And <clears throat> our response is, no, we're not, you know, back here to run people off their land. We're not back here to, to you know, cause any kind of consternation with anybody. Our efforts is just to do our best that we can to reclaim our, our traditional country, but in a way that, uh, you know, that it can be recognized as such, even though if we, not, if we don't own that particular parcel of land, but that it's recognized as such. Um, the, some of the uh, tribes that are in the area, right now that are fairly recognized, we are seeing a change in the designation of traditional country. Uh, some of the maps that were shown here, uh, they are just wrong. Uh, are, that's not the traditional um, uh, extent of our country. One of the maps shows that the San Carlos people, uh, their boundaries all the way up to the New Mexico line, and that's, that was not so. Uh, same with the, the Mescaleros, they're claiming all the way to the east side of the Rio Grande. Uh, that's not so. Uh, that was our country. And now we have the Tiwa and Isleta uh, down by El Paso that are starting to claim that country around there and say that it's theirs. But traditionally, no. It's ours. It was ours. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, our, our first effort is to first 
get this country recognized as, as Chiricahua because there was a great effort to erase that. And especially here in Silver City, we saw that there was an effort to just give credit to the Pueblos, that they were the ones that were actually here, that they were here much longer than they really were, and that Apaches, we just basically were just wandering around the place with nothing to do, nowhere to go, and just existing, you know, uh, lightly off the land as best as we could, like we were surviving or something. Uh, but that's not so. We just had a whole different uh, lifestyle and we used the entire country. Um, but nowadays, it's, uh, we recognize that it's different. We know that there are people in the area that uh, are sympathetic to that history and that um, uh, it's been sort of proven by people that have just reached out to us just uh, out of the blue. They've contacted us and said, well, you know, we have some land that our family acquired a long time ago and we're not, um, we're not sure what to do with it, but we recognize that it is Apache country and our efforts is to return it. So there is a, uh, I guess, a sentiment to, for some people, that uh, Apaches should be here. And um, we recognize and appreciate that. And uh, we hope just to do our best to reestablish ourselves uh, and bring back, our main focus is to bring back uh, ceremonies, bring back uh, songs, music, gatherings, uh, and that's what our focus is at the moment, just to bring people back to this area. Uh, later, on, later on, once we develop more as a tribe, uh, develop more as an organization, and uh, establish and strengthen our partnerships with people here, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to find our place again here. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Joe. James, does that answer your question? Uh, one more question. Uh, how does Joe spell his uh, last name? That is a good question. Joe? Uh, S is in Sam, A is in Apple, E is in Edward, N is in Nancy, and Z is in Zebra. Great. Thank you. <laughs> the right words to the letters. <laughs> okay. Um, Vicky, Victoria Nickel. Uh, has her hand raised, so I'm going to see what she would like to say. Victoria, are you there? Victoria? Yeah. That's... Yes, I'm here. Hi, Victoria. Did you um, have something to say to one of our panelists? Uh, no, good work. Keep it up. <laughs> good. We're really um, excited that your um, tribe is doing this work, and and uh, and I think the Fort Bayard project really is really exciting, and I hope, hope that you um, succeed, get it all worked out with the state and the town and so forth. Thank you for this program. It was very interesting. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Um, let's, I'm going to, I have another question from John Freeman. John, are you there? John would like to know if you are affiliated with the group developing Akela Flats near Deming. Uh, the Aquila Flats, what's oh, your connection? The, but, yeah. um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the group at Aquila Flats, that's Fort Sill. Um, our understanding is that Fort Sill is, uh, has had their reservation established in, um, well, actually, their land allotment established in Oklahoma. My understanding is that they don't have a reservation there. Uh, that has been sort of one of our legacies is that as Chiricahua and Warm Springs people, uh, to have our own reservation is uh, our own land has been a, a, a battle in itself. And my understanding is that Fort Sill, the uh, Chiricahua and Warm Spring uh, descendants that are in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, 
are also attempting to come back here as a group. Uh, at the moment, they only have a, an attempt at a casino and gambling um, a restaurant and cafe there in Deming, but um, as Apache history tells us that most of the bands were independent of each other, even though we may collaborate, uh, trade, intermarry, things like that, that most of the bands were, or the bands were distinct and, and independent. Uh, that is true today. Uh, the, the four groups that are in the area, we operate independently, uh, but because this is something new that all these groups are here now, we have to develop that relationship. Um, we have to uh, develop that unity between all of us. Um, we're, you know, but uh, as far as a reconnection uh, at the moment, no. No, we are an independent group. The only thing that we have in common at the moment with Fort Sill is that we are both participants in the Gila River Festival. Uh, we collaborate to uh, help promote the Gila River and that, and, uh, that organization. So that's uh, the only uh, association that we have at the moment. Uh, but I hope that in the future we will, uh, because I do know that we have uh, Fort Sill tribal members that our tribal members with us too. So hopefully that that association will slowly grow. All right. Thank you. Well, did that answer your question, John? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um let's see, next I have Emma Schreiber. Emma, are you there? I'm here. I'm here Hi, with Emma. Jenny. Um, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Ask a question. Oh, so I see limited numbers of, of books, um, history of uh, Apache, especially the Chiricahua. How are you guys obtaining accurate history to put in the, this history building? Um, you know, the, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, fortunately for us, um, uh, we share the history. Uh, that's part of the oral tradition was that that history and the lessons and stories everything was uh, intermingled and uh, told that way as i mentioned earlier growing up even at a young age uh, my grandfather was always al already telling the stories of the migration and, and where they came from and who these people were uh, most of my stories are from my elders my family uh, we have tribal elders that uh, are very open with us and share stories with us. Uh, I had hoped that one of our elders would, would have been here today, but um, his uh, health uh, prevented it from him. Um, but I'm sure that he'll be involved in other, in other discussions and other presentations in the future. Um, but we hear the stories from our own people. Um, you know, I, I grew up with my father telling me just, you know, uh, closed mouth, open ears as a child. And um, I was fortunate enough to be in a family uh, that told those stories. Um, you know, at the age of nine years old, I was uh, an apprentice in a saddle shop. My father's side of the family, that was their craft, was saddles. That's how they entered the modern economy. Uh, by developing the saddles. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Western saddles are not cowboy. Western saddles come from the Indian designs. Uh, that was just a design that was stolen and enhanced and adjusted and became known as a Western saddle, but Western saddles are Indian design. Um, and so these stories come from our families, our friends, our elders, uh, people that are willing to share this because we depend on that oral tradition so much. Uh, there are a lot of good books out there. Um, you know, it, it, you need to take some of those with a little bit of uh, discretion. I know, uh, you know, I've had to sort of learn through some of the books that I've gone through and, and read to see what, what they had in them. Um, but, um, you know, one example was uh, Kremeny. Uh, Kremeny was a writer. I wrote some books about Apache history, but you know I understand from elders that he exaggerated quite a bit. One of the modern writers, but uh, I, uh, I understand that he passed away here recently, was Edwin Sweeney. Uh, Edwin Sweeney 
uh, had an advantage because he endeared some of the Apache families to uh, interview them regarding their histories. And so it was actually people telling them stories, and that's how we got these books. Uh, so it, it's, you know, as modern as we may be at the moment, we still have elders that are passing on stories to us. Uh, we're not just going to books and, and reading. I mean, some of that research that we have to do, yeah, it takes us to some paperwork, some books, uh, because of our history and the genocide war that we experienced here, we did lose a lot of things. Uh, there are things that we may never get back. There are some things that we may get back in pieces. There are some things that we have held on to. Um, but, you know, I, I recommend uh, attending any, any uh, Native functions because you will hear stories. Uh, if you are interested in information, uh, you know, that, that's at least one of the, the recent ones. And quite a few of the books that are autobiographies, um, you know, some of those I understand that the, they are factual, but that sometimes the person that wrote the story, like Jerome, was autobiography. Um, I understand that, that the gentleman that wrote it, uh, Barrett, I believe it was Barrett, um, he did exaggerate a little bit, you know, not, not really bad, I understand, but he did, you know, do some exaggeration. Um, but those books, uh, The Victoria Days, written by, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, Kapuji, and John was... Um, Autobiography. autobiography, the Edward Sweeney books, uh, and, there, and there's actually quite a few books. Uh, the military was great about writing history. Uh, that's how we learned a lot about the, during the Spanish time, was the Spanish military also kept a lot of records. Um, so some of our records, we have to go to the actual source of the documents. Uh, I've had friends that have told me that they've shown up in Washington, D.C. to look through records, and then they bring those stories back. Uh, so I, I hope that helps. Yeah, I was hoping that some of the oral history will be written down so that it's preserved. You know, that we're- We can um, take share the grandkids. Yeah, we could, yeah. for future generations, that oral history is still preserved. Yeah. I, I hope. To. I might add that the Doris Duke Foundation uh, did a lot of recording when I was a graduate student there at UNM. I don't remember how long that period was, but this uh, uh, woman gave a great deal of money to the university for that foundation to record the stories of Native Americans. That's good. And, and one of the um, recent uh, works that I came across was uh, there is in White Mountain, uh, there is an effort and there is a project to record uh, elders and Apaches uh, talking about plants. Okay. And uh, to record that history, uh, mm -hmm. the oral tradition of identifying plants and their uses, um, they are recording that. So, you know, there is, um, there is efforts to record some of these oral traditions. Um, That's good. Some of us <laughs> prefer to maintain it as an oral tradition. Um, we don't want to lose that. That's, that's a tradition. Uh, and so uh, I know elders that refuse to speak on camera. I know elders that refuse to record. I know elders that, you know, will not do prayers or anything if there's a recording or, a, or a video camera or anything like that. Uh, just as we have uh, uh, the uh, Mount Spirit dancers, uh, that their sole responsibility is to not do anything with technology, uh, light, indoors, anything like that. And so they're, they're maintaining their traditions as best as they can. Uh, and so there, there are Apaches that are holding on to those traditions as, as strongly as they can. But unfortunately, the, there is an interest and there is a um, venue to, uh, to do it in a written form. Um, you know, that, that's been lucky for us too. Uh, to be able to find information that was recorded by the Spanish, the Americans, uh, the Mexicans. Uh, I would just like to remind everybody that we do actually at the Silver City Museum store have several books by Sweeney and um, a large collection of other um, literature on Apache tribes. 
Um, so if anyone is interested in that, please email store at silvercitymuseum.org and they are available for purchase. <clears throat> You do not have one of the best books, as far as I'm concerned, you did at one time, was called Nine Years Among the Indians, about a young German boy in Fredericksburg, Texas, who was captured, spent uh, half of his time with the Apaches and half of his time with Comanches, and recorded his story. And it's uh, one of the very best books in the Southwest on Indians. Like well, Melody is listening, so I'll let her know. She's the store manager. <laughs> you can email her or uh, just visit our website at www.silvercitymuseum.org. Emma, does that answer your question or did you have I, more? No, my sister Jenny is also here joining with us. Um, if she had one more question about history. I have, I have a question for Joe. Uh, you mentioned Tortugas Pueblo. Um, what clan would you believe that is uh, part of the Chikawa? Um, well, the, the Tortugas Pueblo, um, you know, I've just recently been uh, kind of uh, introduced to them and, and getting to know more about them because we are trying to establish what Apache groups are in the area so we can uh, attempt to collaborate or attempt to even recognize them. Right. Um, so, so that we have a full understanding of how many Apaches have, have come back or are in the area already. Uh, not all of us have come back. There are Apaches that have been here for a while that they have maintained their family history lines through some of the Spanish and Mexican uh, families. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the majority of Apaches, uh, they, they have attempted to come back or they have come back. Um, <clears throat> the Tortugas, uh, my understanding is that here recently, they're transforming into a tri-group, I believe. Uh, my understanding is that there's uh, factions in the group that are actually calling themselves uh, Piro Mansos Kiwa, which is a combination of, of whatever native people are in that vicinity, including El Paso and Las Cruces. But the Tortugas Pueblo, they, they were identifying themselves mainly as um, Kiro Mansos. But I understand that the Mansos, again, was that Spanish word for tame, so Apaches that you know, were more likely to come in and trade and, and visit uh, for whatever reason. But my understanding, because of their location, that they would be directly related to the Warm Springs people. Oh, oh, interesting. Oh, interesting because we have family members in Tortugas Pueblo. Our our father and mother were both born there and our grandparents and great grandparents as well. So yeah, I believe their, their leader is uh, Montoya, I believe his name. Oh, I, uh, I, I haven't had an opportunity to visit with him, but uh, I've met a couple of the people that live in the Pueblo. Yes, but we were always raised knowing we were uh, Apache. So that's why I found it interesting you mentioned the Tortugas because uh, we are part of your tribe and um, yeah you know the, the name Mansos uh, you know it is a Spanish word um, and so um, you know it would be uh, uh, great for them to identify themselves uh, you know by by band or by tribe right. uh, but my understanding is that's what they choose to call themselves and so right we will address them with that. I see, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Emma and Jenny. Okay, um, we have an anonymous question, but a good question. Um, what exactly is a federal, federally recognized non-dependent tribe? Um, <clears throat> federally, Federally recognized non-dependent tribe is, um, and I don't know exactly the history of that classification, but it is a, a classification that we are looking to work toward. Um, in the past several years and in the past, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years, there have been several tribes that have been decommissioned uh, and I understand that at the moment there are four tribes that are trying to uh, get re-recognized. Uh, and one of them is the Miamis out of Ohio. 
they were recent, uh, a few years back, I think during the, the time of my third hearing in Boulder, that was brought up in the hearing. Um, one of the judges asked one of the prosecutors regarding their, their status, uh, the Miamis, uh, because if their recognition had been taken away, then they would also be violating any eagle feather uh, laws. Uh, and so that question came up during the hearing. But my understanding was they had just been recently decommissioned. And so that was one other group that was working toward this uh, federally non-dependent. <clears throat> my understanding is that the government has been, for quite a while, has been trying to decommission all tribes and abrogate all treaties. Uh, and one of, the, one of the main reasons, again, was either land or the responsibility for financial assistance. And the thought was uh, brought up that possibly if we applied as non-dependent, that the government did not have to give us any money or afford us any benefits, that we are okay with that because we can do our own. Uh, we can take care of ourselves. Um, we see what happens with the BIA. We see what happens with all these uh, situations when money's involved and tribes are involved, casinos. Uh, it can be a mess, but... Um, uh, the financial assistant can the financial assistance can also be a big difference, but for us to help us in our process of being federally recognized, we're hoping that it will be noticed that we are not asking for any benefits, that we just be identified as a cultural group. Right now, we are our status is a 501c3. Uh, that was our first um, designation. Uh, we are a religious. Uh, under the religious uh, title for the 501c3. Uh, that was the closest thing we could find that identified us as a group and still allowed us to independently financially work toward our own betterment. Um, and so that, you know, the, those are the kind of things we'll be looking at to uh, further the recognition of the Chiricahua and Warm Springs that are in this area or around anywhere. Because even like in even like in Mescalero, uh, you know, I talked to the Chiricahuas over there, and even though they may be identified, it is not a Chiricahua reservation; it's a Mescalero reservation. So they're lumped in as Mescaleros. Wow. Okay. Thank you. That is a very good answer. Um, it looks like we still have a few more questions, uh, but we are getting short on time. So I'm going to try to get some of those answered as quickly as we can. Um, if anyone else has something that you would like to say uh, before we uh, leave for the day, then please put your questions in that QA box or um, press the click on the raise hand uh, next to your name in the participant box and we will bring you on. Um, so just another question um, from Joyce Newman asked, were there interactions between the Apache and Buffalo soldiers any different than the interactions between the Apache and Anglo soldiers? A little call back to earlier. I didn't get the last part of it. Interaction. Oh. Sorry, were interactions between the Apache and Buffalo soldiers different than the, infer the interactions between the Apache and Anglo soldiers? Bail, you want to? Well, I still didn't, I didn't hear the very last word. Uh, what's, what was their differences in the interaction between the <clears throat> Buffalo soldiers versus Apaches and white soldiers versus Apaches? There was a lot of discrimination back at that time. I lived at Fort Union and we had four murdered men buried in what was my backyard. Black soldiers. And that, that, that happened. And there was this uh, hatred. There was a little revolt down at Cummings. And... Uh, that was uh, pretty serious. It's been written about that revolt uh, against uh, those soldiers at that time. Blacks uh, were also at the infantry units beside 9th and 10th 
Cavalry, the 23rd, 24th Infantry. It was a wonderful thing for these freed slaves <clears throat> to uh, experience life that was different than under slavery, and they began these units uh, after the Civil War. And there was hatred uh, among a lot of the whites uh, toward the blacks. But I believe, uh, although I'm, it, it's a difficult thing, uh, they were uh, more accepted by the uh, Apaches than uh, on the other side of the coin. Uh, Joe, you could say more about that perhaps, uh, the military aspect. Well, you know, the, um, I've asked elders regarding, um, you know, what their thoughts were about the Buffalo soldiers and what stories they might have had. Um, but, um, it just seemed like uh, the the encounters were never meaningful as far as you know getting to really know what the relationships were or anything like that. Uh, I participated in a project uh, with the um, I guess it's the History Channel called uh, Battle Battlefield Detective, and I I uh, uh, participated in a reenactment of um, of the uh, Denegia battle up in Hickory, and then uh, the one more related to our people, the uh, Dog Canyon uh, fight, and um, which is down here, uh, down here in southwest New Mexico, over by the Sacramentos, uh, that the Apaches were coming back over from the east side of the Sacramentos and coming on to the west side, headed back toward the Rio Grande. And it seems that uh, you know the, the change was uh, uh, noticeable, but it was a change. Uh, where in Sinaguilla we're fighting just uh, white soldiers, and at the Dog Canyon uh, uh, fights, uh, now we're now we're dealing with black soldiers. Um, the interesting thing for us to realize is that uh, before the blacks became slaves, uh, it was the Indians. Uh, they perfected their craft on us. Um, the Indians were the first slaves. Um, and so, you know, there are stories of, of trying to understand how these people being slaves could then uh, turn around and kill people for those, for those um, uh, slave owners. Um, and so th there was not, my understanding, there was not a lot of interest in getting to know them uh, because they were doing the same thing. They were trying to kill us. Uh, but it was recognized that they were different. Um, and so, I, you know, it, it is a difficult uh, question. It's a good question, but as, you know, the, that's what we were hoping to come to terms with, was uh, uh, getting together with these Buffalo Soldier units and discussing to see what stories the Buffalo Soldiers had, you know. Um, what history they had, where they were involved. Um, maybe they could tell us more about the battles, things like that, uh, and understand that. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, uh, according to my own reading, is that, of course, one thing we need to understand is that uh, the Buffalo soldiers uh, were under the command of white officers. And uh, in many cases, the native people saw the uniform. They didn't see necessarily the guy that was in it. Uh, and the uniform meant, uh, in certainly combat situations, those were enemy soldiers. And so to that extent, there was no difference. Okay, great. That was a... Very complicated question and some great answers. And thank you very much. At this time, um, I have another question by Art Ratcliffe. And like I said, we're closing up. So let's try to keep this um, as succinct as possible. 
Art, are you there? Art? Never mind. Oh, Art is there. Hi, Bart. Art. No, I'm... Hello? Yes, I was just curious as to, I was wondering if the uh, White Mountain Apache was a tribe or a band uh, separate from the other Apache tribes. Um, no, the White Mountain were a people all to themselves. At the moment, I don't um, have their traditional names. Um, that would have been a great question for the elder. Uh, but they were a distinct group. Um, the, the White Mountain Apaches uh, had their own country. Um, and they were typically uh, in the superstitious and the White Mounts. That's the, the country that they occupied all the way from Phoenix, uh, north of Phoenix, and east of Phoenix. Um, the biggest uh, groups that were bordered along us uh, on the west side of us, besides the White Mountains, down to the San Carlos, and into the Chiricahuas, uh, were what we refer to as the Hohokam people. Uh, the, Marico, the Maricopas, the Pimas, the Toro Dan, the Toro, or the Odom Cash, uh, all those people, they were the next tribes that were over uh, past those mountain ranges. Um, but we were known to often go to White Mountain. Um, you know, the uh, Apaches were sometimes very fickle of who they got along with. Uh, it wasn't always a tribal venture. There may be rivalries, there may be feuds. Uh, sometimes we got along together, sometimes we didn't. Um, you know, in some cases, it was an opportunistic relationship. If we needed help, they would help us. If they needed help, we would help them. But um, we were a very distinct group uh, from them. Um, I believe the White Mountain people uh, um, do their, their culture in, in uh, clans, as opposed to the Chiricahua who do that in bands. Uh, clans are more of the, of the blood relation, uh, immediate family relations, and bands uh, aren't restricted to that. Uh, they can be um, um, associates. So uh, we did differ in that way. Um, but uh, no, they were, they were distinct groups. Thank you very much. Um, does that answer your question, Art? Okay. Uh, along those lines, we have another question from an anonymous um, attendee who wants to know if the nation interacts with other tribes like Fort Sill, or is there still tension between the Chiricahua and the Fort Sill tribes? Um, you know, the, the, the Fort Sill and the Fort Sill administration, I have to say administration because it's not all Fort Sill people, um, uh, are very wary that, um, you know, that there's other Apaches in the area um, because uh, I believe that uh, they, they think that they're the only Apaches left. Uh, we've gotten that uh, uh, sentiment in many forms from them, um, but it seems to be just the administration. Uh, our view is that we don't really care. Uh, you know, we are Chiricahua, we are Warm Springs. Uh, they can deny all they want, uh, they have before, but um, that does not influence us. Um, we have been involved in many protests, we have been involved in many uh, battles, and we will not hesitate to reach out to Fort Sill to call them in, to ask them to come and help, uh, because we believe it also impacts them. Uh, eventually, when all Chiricahuas come back, uh, or identify this area as their homeland and their home base, um, you know, we're going to need each other. Um, right now, I see that, that our association may be improving uh, by us working together on the Gila River Festival. Uh, the last time we had a river blessing, uh, some of the Fort Sill people came down and it was great. It was a great gathering. It was a great ceremony. Uh, and so, I think there's only a few people that feel that way. Uh, and I think the rest 
can quickly identify with family. I mean, that's what happened at that ceremony. They started realizing, oh, hey, we're related to each other. We're related to the San Carlos. We're related to these people. Uh, and, and that that goes quite a you know quite a long way, quite a long ways with the Apaches. Um, we're not interested in the bickering. We're not interested in who's who or what. Uh, we need to move on and we need to uh, reestablish ourselves. I know the Fort Sill is, is uh, making efforts to come back. Um, they had those land allotments in Oklahoma, but uh, they may be at risk. Um, and there's just not enough land for them. Um, and so they need to, uh, they need to expand. Blood is thicker than water. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, anyone else have anything to say? I think we're going to wrap up here soon. Um, would anyone else like to say anything? Any closing statements? Doug, Dale, Joe? i just like to thank Will and uh, everyone who made this possible and especially those who tuned in and, and asked the great questions today. Absolutely. Anyone else? Did a great job. Thank you very much. You all did a fantastic job. And um, I just want to remind everybody that is still with us that this video will be recorded and, well, has been recorded, sorry, and will be put online at the Silver City Museum website um, soon. Please, if you haven't, if you haven't already um, checked that you wanted to receive information from our website, email me at education at silvercitymuseum.org and I will make sure that you are on that list. You will be to be notified um, when this comes out. Also, please donate and visit our website. Uh, the link to donate is www.silvercitymuseumsociety.org slash virtual tip jar. It's on your in your uh, chat box and it'll probably possibly pop up when we end this program. I also want to thank Will Western Institute for Lifelong Learning for putting this together with me and making this just such a wonderful conversation and so many ideas for other interesting conversations such as the Buffalo Soldiers and other things have come out of it and I'm happy to be able to help share all of this information and what's going on at Fort Baird and in our society and our community today um, to just keep moving things forward and bringing out that message and support for the Apache people and the Warm Springs, Chiricahua, Apache especially. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, for wonderful panelists. And um, with that, thank you. Have a good night.